people who have their video on, uh, you will not be on the recorded video, so don't worry about uh, privacy concerns. It turns out that it only records my video and uh, the slides that I'm sharing. So um, without further ado, let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Can you see the slides? Can you see my pointer? Uh, all right, let me... Okay, cool. Um, how's the audio? Can you guys hear me? Can you nod if you can hear me? Yeah, awesome, perfect. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about single cell genomics and uh, specifically deep learning methods for single cell genomics. So the goal is to uh, be able to uh, infer uh, information at the single cell level. So we're gonna talk about technologies that enable us to do that, specifically single cell RNA-seq, single cell attack-seq, single cell multi-omics. And we're gonna talk about how we scale up these technologies and then how to deal with noise, with doublets, and other uh, single cell RNA-seq issues. Then uh, an outline of what are the computational challenges in single cell RNA-seq data analysis, and what are the deep learning approaches that have been used for single cell RNA-seq. And then lastly, how do we go beyond single cell RNA-seq to single cell attack-seq and uh, multi-omics. So, just a sec, let me set that up. Here on the side. Awesome. So foundations, first of all, why profile uh, single cells? So the first challenge is when we look at bulk data, when we look at say a brain biopsy and then we measure RNA in the brain, or when we look at a liver biopsy and we measure RNA in the liver, uh, which are the examples that I've been using for the last few lectures, what you end up is an average over many dimensions. You end up with an average over many different cell types. You end up with an average over many different cell states, very different developmental uh, uh, states of different cells, different responses, and different temporal uh, positions in the cell cycle, as well as different temporal positions in whatever response the cells are undergoing. So if you look under the microscope, you see that cells are extremely heterogeneous. So averaging the expression of this cell and that cell and that cell and that cell will basically give you something that does not represent any one of these cells. The second reason is that cells differentiate. They start with hematopoietic stem cells, for example, and then they can differentiate into all of the different blood lineages, uh, you know, all the different uh, myeloid and thymus uh, lineages. Uh, and from those, you basically end up with um, uh, again, a very different mix of completely different functions of cells if you profile whole blood. Similarly, even within a cell type, there are dramatic differences between individual cells, which are, again, impossible to capture, even if you were to cell sort for, say, different cell markers that capture each of these cell types. And similarly, when cells respond to the environment, the specific receptors that they have will capture only uh, you know, the, the environment of the cell to a partial degree. And what you're gonna get at the whole uh, tissue level or the whole organ level is gonna be an average of those responses, whereas in fact, depending on the amount of viral protein that the cell might detect, each cell might actually have a very different response. And again, you can see this under the microscope where cells that respond to an immune stimulus are in fact very, very different to each other in the response patterns. And then lastly, uh, another reason to actually carry out single cell profiling is that if you look at circulating tumor cells or if you look at the early embryo of the zebrafish, you only have eight cells. So the uh, methods that we are using for um, capturing bulk RNA basically means that if there's only 1% of your cells that are tumors in your sample, you will completely miss that. And similarly, if you only have very, very few cells uh, in your embryo, you might also miss that. The other uh, major uh, issue is that if you look at a bulk uh, data set, and these are the individual data points of the expression of one RNA uh, molecule, one RNA, one gene uh, across different cells, you might actually have in the real data a very bimodal distribution. Some cells might be expressing a lot of that uh, gene, 
and some other cells might be expressing very little of that gene. But when you look at the bulk profile, you will end up with an average of those completely missing the bimodality. The other issue with bulk data is that rare events can be lost. If you look at the distribution of uh, average values, um, you will end up moving that distribution very, very close to the average, when in fact there might be some individual cells that have overwhelmingly strong signal for that gene, and this might be completely lost in the bulk data. So this is uh, not a new concept. Basically, folks have been trying to uh, study individual cells for a long time. And these approaches have been traditionally using microscopy to basically look at uh, individual uh, labeled RNAs with about five probes. So you can measure five different RNAs. And you, know, you can capture all kinds of spatial information about those. And uh, you know, this is very, very rich for any one cell, but uh, it only captures very, very few genes and very little information uh, for those uh, you know, across, across the other genes. There's no information. This has been scaled up a little bit with some molecular beacons and with fish technologies and with in situ sequencing, looking at many additional probes. So basically looking at you know, large numbers of probes and um, you know, with single cell RNA sequencing, we can now start looking at you know, effectively large, large numbers of uh, cells. By the way, the PDF of the lecture has been posted on the chat. So what's the underlying foundational technology for a lot of these single cell RNA sequencing uh, approaches? Uh, the idea is RT-PCR. So uh, the uh, concept is that you start with a live cell and then you extract RNA and then you basically uh, carry out reverse transcription and you add primers and you basically, um, you know, measure the RNA expression of your population. So the way that this has been carried out in very early studies was to isolate individual cells painstakingly through either flow cytometry or through uh, capture with pipettes or any other such method, and then to measure as many genes as possible using those individual cells. And of course, this requires a massive amount of amplification within these wells to basically capture a large number of genes with uh, RNA sequencing of a single cell in a single well. And of course, there's all kinds of challenges with being able to even handle uh, that much small of a sample when um, most uh, RNA profiling methods have been really optimized for bulk samples with many, many RNA molecules and many cells. Uh, so there has been a lot of optimization for single cell per tube uh, preamplification and so on and so forth. And then this has been applied to study individual cells across, uh, you know, different contexts. The key advantage of single cell RNA sequencing is that you can now do this not just for five or ten uh, probes, but for hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of, cell, of, of genes across thousands of cells. So the idea is that you take your tissue, you can carry out RNA-seq of the whole tissue. You might create a single cell suspension that includes both uh, you know, single cell and um, RNA preparations, and then dissociate individual cells, and then isolate these single cells. And you can isolate them using your pipette. You can basically you know, suck in one cell at a time or you can use a cell sorter that basically fires cells individually and then sort of uh, can visualize their properties and capture them or let them through. And more recently with microfluidics that basically uh, bring cells through a series of chambers that allow them to move uh, individual cells around. And then after that, the key step is again, this reverse transcription reaction starting with a poly A tail uh, and then ending up with uh, some kind of um, amplification. So basically you end up with an amplification of the RNA by PCR or uh, all kinds of other things. And what you end up with is a measurement of individual genes across individual cells. And now you can basically see that every column here represents a different cell. And you can see how these cells are behaving 
in different conditions after you know uh, no stimulation at zero hours or after one hour two hours four hours six hours and you can see here the individual genes that turn on in a subset of cells and then some of these genes turn on in all of the cells in those conditions and so on and so forth uh, raise your hands if you're with me so far in terms of what we're seeing here awesome great so this is the you know the basic premise this is the basic uh challenge and basically what we're seeing is that the single cell rna seq data that you obtain from these experiments effectively looks like bulk rna data in many cases so if you look at this gene ubb at the bottom you see 10,000 cells at a time averaged and then at the top you see individual cells so one cell at a time so you can see these RNA molecules are piling on from that one cell exactly the way that they're piling on across tens of thousands of cells. So for this column, it's very reassuring. It basically tells us, great, we can capture RNA-seq information in individual cells. And that's true for many of the genes, where many of the genes are basically expressed you know, with all of their exons in all of these uh, different cells. But then the story gets more complex for some of the genes. You basically see that for this gene, yes, the bulk looks like that. Many of the individual cells look exactly the same way. But for some cells, you simply don't have expression. So what could be happening here? Same thing here. You basically have completely no expression for some cells and then very low expression for other cells and maybe only one X in here and so on and so forth. So what's, what ends up happening is maybe in those individual cells, something went wrong with the experiment. You know, that's one possibility. But if you look at other genes, they look perfectly fine. So the experiment seems to have worked for those cells. Another possibility is that these genes were randomly dropped out. That maybe because I'm only looking at very, very few cells, one cell at a time, maybe that one cell, you know, um, somehow the RNA got stuck in the wrong side of the cell and it wasn't captured. So there are all kinds of technical reasons why this could be happening. But the much more interesting biological reason is that these cells might actually just not be expressing that RNA at that particular time. Maybe I only need this RNA to be expressed every two hours. And sure, all of these cells are expressing it when I catch them on, in the act of transcription. They're highly expressing. But these cells, maybe they just ran out. Maybe they're about to express it. Or maybe, there's cell-to-cell -cell variability, where some cells in the tissue really must express that gene, but not all cells in the tissue need to express that gene. So maybe having only one out of 10 cells expressing that gene is perfectly fine. And there's all kinds of reasons why true biological cell-to-cell -cell variability might actually be underlying this data. And this is confirmed when you look at these genes with different profiles under the microscope with fluorescent labels. What you can see here is that this gene, which is systematically expressed across all of the cells, is indeed lighting up in all of the cells under the microscope. This gene, which is only expressed in some of the cells, but completely absent from other cells, is indeed showing exactly the same pattern under the microscope with a bimodal distribution, just like we saw earlier. Many, many cells just don't express this at all, and then other cells expressed it at pretty fine level. And then if you looked at the bulk tissue, you would say, oh, this gene is very lowly expressed by all of, the gene, all of the cells, without realizing that, no, it's very highly bimodal. It's either expressed with hundreds of molecules or with zero molecules. And then if you look at some of these intermediate data sets, even though you can see that those intermediate values are indeed captured under the microscope, you see these very strongly expressing cells where that particular gene, IL6, IL6, is actually very strongly expressed. And then you see other cells where this gene is very weakly expressed. Is everybody with me so far? So basically, this intercell uh, variability can be captured systematically using uh, a single cell RNA seq. And then if you look at these housekeeping genes that are uh, the least variable, you basically see that you know, they're always on. And if you look at some of the most variable genes, you see that in some cases, they're only expressed in one cell at a time. And then, uh, you know, very, very few cells are actually expressing it. 
All right. So that's the basic premise of what we're trying to achieve. We're basically trying to sort of profile uh, information at the single cell level. So if you have any questions, now's a, now's a good time to chat. All right. So how is that uh, feasible? How do we actually make single cell RNA-seq possible? So what I showed you before was basically technology that could profile, you know, maybe 10 cells at a time. And then uh, this is, you know, a few years ago. But since then, on this log axis, technology has dramatically improved to being able to profile tens of thousands of uh, cells at a time uh, and hundreds of thousands of cells at a time. So let's look at what are the underlying technologies that, ena that enable this uh, dramatic exponential scaling of the single cell RNA seq technology. So basically, we went from having individual pipettes capturing individual cells and then putting them into wells to uh, having you know, microscope and capillary pipettes to ultimately having fax sorting, where with a laser, you can basically decide which cells you care about and which cells you don't care about. And um, ultimately, ultimately being able to actually carry out laser capture micro dissection to basically select individual cell types to more recently being able to actually carry out microfluidic separation of individual cells, effectively capturing these cells and trapping them along with specific barcodes in these um, you know, gel droplets that are effectively separated from each other in an oil medium that effectively allows you to, to capture individual cells. And then more recently to uh, liquid-based collections and um, as I'll show you soon, uh, combinatorial barcoding of individual cells. But regardless of the individual technology being utilized, the, the key idea is the same. You basically want to physically separate the cells into uh, some kind of uh, wells. This could be either a big tube or individual wells in a 96 well plate or in a 384 well plate. And then the traditional approach has been to carry out um, profiling by physical separation of these cells into microfluidic chips and then sequencing of the entire well each time with full length RNA sequencing and then being able to detect gene expression, splicing, and all kinds of additional information for the individual cell in each of the wells. More recently, this has been pushed to much, much higher throughput with cells not being sorted, but instead trapped inside hydrogel droplets uh, with methods like DropSeq and InDrop and also the cells that are physically separated from fax orders have been also profiled using these amplification methods with cell seek, mar seek, et cetera. And then after this full PCR amplification, these methods are effectively only sequencing the three prime UTR of these genes, where basically the reverse transcription begins with the poly A tail and the TT primer that you know, initiates the reverse transcription. And then that leads to uh, simply measuring of gene expression without necessarily being able to capture the uh, full length, the splice variant, and other information about those cells, okay? So the, the key approaches are outlined here along with their cost. We basically went from uh, fax sorting and uh, capturing cells by laser and being able to capture millions of cells per experiment but only measuring up to 17 markers. And then with CYTOF and QPCR, we basically were able to scale that to up to 40 markers at a much, much higher cost per cell. So if you want to carry out, I don't know, a million cells, you would have to spend, uh, if you want to profile a million cells, you would have to spend $35 million, uh, which is of course prohibitive. Um, or with micropipetting and QPCR, Yes, you could only spend $1 per cell, but you would get very few genes and you would only get very few cells, like 300 to 1,000 cells. Similarly, uh, fluidine basically was based on microfluidics, and then that allowed you to capture only you know, 50 to 100 cells per experiment at, again, a prohibitive cost of $35 per cell. But being able to capture 6,000 to 9,000 you know, uh, genes per cell for cell lines or 1,000 to 5,000 for primary cells. 
So basically these technologies each have a limitation either in the very small number of markers or in the very few small number of cells that you can profile. But three technologies have basically stood out as having both many, many uh, cells for uh, each experiment, so hundreds of cells or thousands of cells, and also having a low enough cost of either $3 per well or uh, $3 per cell or five cents per cell with uh, you know, the 10X uh, genomics platform uh, more recently. So how do these work? Well, for SmartSeq, uh, one of the earliest methods to be developed, as I showed you on the previous slide, the key idea is that you're basically flowing the cells uh, in a tube, and then with the laser, you're basically uh, you know, deciding whether to keep or not individual uh, cells using either you know, a, a multi-well plate below and some deflection plate that sort of moves the cells uh, that you don't care about away. And then after you put these cells into wells, the rest of the experiment is effectively an RNA-seq experiment. Okay? Uh, raise your hands if you're with me on the first approach here. Yeah? So basically, I'm just capturing individual cells, putting them to individual wells, and then carrying out a traditional quote-unquote uh, quote RNA-seq reaction that is basically only trying to capture the um, you know, information inside that one well, uh, optimized for the fact that there's only one cell in that well. The next approach is very, very cool. It's basically saying, instead of using wells to carry out my reaction, I'm gonna use micro droplets to carry my reaction. So the idea is the following. I'm gonna uh, create a big tube of individual gel beads, each of which contains a single barcode with, I don't know, 10 letters long. So this is four to the 10 possible barcodes. Everybody with me on this part? Raise your hands or shake your heads. Yeah, perfect. Then I'm gonna be flowing these gel beads in this microfluidic tube, and I'm gonna be flowing cells into those as well. So basically I'm flowing the individual cells that I have suspended, either from this approach or from other kinds of suspensions, okay? And then these cells are gonna be entering these individual droplets. So here's a zoom in here, where you basically have a droplet that has a bead with a specific barcode. This barcode basically contains, I don't know, 10 or 20 nucleotides, as well as a unique molecular identifier. And the goal for this UMI, for this unique molecular identifier, is to effectively distinguish uh, PCR artifacts of amplifying the exact same RNA molecule or actually genuinely capturing different RNA molecules. And also, also of course, a PCR handle, which you're gonna be using to initiate your uh, polymerase chain reaction amplification. Everybody with me so far? Raise your hands if you're with me on the idea here. Awesome. So basically the idea is that all of these reactions are now gonna be capturing, uh, uh, captured inside these droplets. So what am I gonna be doing with these droplets once I've trapped the cell into the droplet? The, uh, you know, the, you see this little light blue circle. It basically contains the cell and the uh, bead within it. And basically then I carry out reactions, you know, millions of droplets at a time within those droplets. And what is the first reaction that I can do? I can basically lyse the cells to sort of break open the RNA. And now the RNA is floating around that droplet and then getting in contact with these uh, barcodes and then being ligated to these uh, barcodes, which then enables me to uniquely label every one of the RNA molecules inside that cell, which is now inside that droplet, with the same exact barcode, basically telling me what cell that RNA came from. Raise your hands if you're with me here. Yes, awesome. So we can basically do that with many, many different barcodes and label every one of those cells and eventually every one of those RNAs inside that cell. 
And then after the fact, you remove the oil, which was basically causing these gel droplets to separate from each other. And that allows you to now carry out an RNA sequencing reaction on a single big tube where the most of the sequence will basically be telling me about which RNA I'm profiling and the barcode which, be, which will be basically telling me how do I group those RNAs according to the cell that they came from. So if I'm sequencing say for example gene uh, 2000, I see that wow I, I've sequenced that gene five times in my pool, four of which had the red barcode and one of which had the blue barcode of the green barcode. So that basically allows me to infer which ones of these RNA molecules for each of the genes came from which cell. I'm gonna stop here and see if people have any questions. Any questions so far? Who's with me? Raise your hands or your thumbs or something. Awesome, very cool. Who thinks this is kind of cool? Yeah? This is very cool, right? So basically, we are now able to sort of, instead of carrying out uh, effectively 384 sequencing reactions to capture 384 cells, we can carry out one sequencing reaction to capture tens of thousands of cells, right? Because in the end, I'm only doing one sequencing reaction. So in terms of the amount of money that I need to spend, it only, you know, th there's just no increased cost in sort of effectively separating out all of the cells. It's as if I was basically doing a traditional bulk RNA sequencing reaction, only every one of my RNAs has a barcode that basically tells me which cell it came from, okay? And this technology has been used extensively across uh, the community. So basically, it's very rare to see a smart seek experiment being done now, nowadays. And the reason is that it costs basically 100 times more and it captures 10 times fewer cells, okay? So basically here we're looking at 50 to 500 cells as opposed to 5,000 to 10,000 cells. And here we're talking about, you know, $3 per well, which is per cell, as opposed to, you know, five cents per cell. All right, everybody comfortable with uh, DropSeq? So, um, Again, the key idea here is that you have this complex tissue, you isolate the individual cells, you suspend these individual cells in these droplets, and then you basically capture, uh, you quote unquote stamp each of your cells with these microparticles that are containing the barcodes. And then that, con that creates a library with tens of thousands of single cells, each uh, you know, with thousands of genes, and each of those genes and each of those RNA molecules has one barcode, which basically tells you what cell they came from. And then the way that you make those barcodes is that you basically have initially, you know, your uh, PCR handle and your, uh, you know, um, you're adding to that by effectively doing multiple rounds of sequences. And, you know, you're adding ATCG or, you know, in, in every one of those wells and then you're increasing and increasing and increasing. And after say 12 rounds of thin synthesis, you basically end up with every one of those beads having a different one of those uh, RNA barcodes. And then after that, you also synthesize your UMIs with an additional round of synthesis. And that basically means that you have millions of the same cell barcode for every bead. And then you have four to the eight different molecular barcodes Per, uh, per bead, okay? So, you know, very, very rare to have uh, the same one. And then you put those beads with the cells, and then you basically uh, have this template switching, which allows you to sequence the uh, barcode first, and then switch over to the RNA. So basically every single one of your reads sort of contains both your uh, initial barcode and the uh, sequence of the gene. Everybody with me here on DropSeq? Awesome. So that's DropSeq. And then there's another method that's still uh, emerging, which is very, very cool and worth noting, which is this combinatorial indexing approach. 
how does that work? You basically uh, have the following idea. So uh, every single one of your, um, actually, <laughs> I'm gonna to go to uh, this uh, split sick uh, the video um, explanation, which is very very cute. So basically, what you need to do, what, what you're trying to do is uh, understand every single cell of a mixed um, tissue with many cells, and every cell is a little ball here, a little tennis uh, sorry ping pong ball, and inside the ping pong ball lie a lot of strings, and these are all of the RNAs of each ping pong ball. So what you need to do is basically break the cells open and then read their RNA. But now we're gonna do something very, very cool. We're never actually gonna create these droplets and we're never going to actually encapsulate these cells. What we're gonna do is prepare large tubes where many, many cells will fit into each of those tubes, okay? So basically we have this, uh, you know, brain uh, bucket that has many, many cells. And we have these hundreds of individually colored buckets that basically have each their own barcode. And now we're gonna take all of our cells and we're gonna split them into say 100 buckets, each with a different color. These buckets are now gonna add a barcode to all of the RNAs inside each of the cells, okay? So we're basically splitting the cells into 100 pools, and every one of those uh, pools basically gets its own um, uh, barcode that you're basically adding to every RNA molecule, okay? So if I'm cell 134, I end up in tube number four in the first experiment, I get barcode number four in the first round. And then I go back out into my bucket, and I get mixed again with all kinds of other cells, many of which were in the same bucket as me, but most of which, 99% of them, were in another bucket. Okay, so if I have 100 wells, I basically end up with um, you know, very different buckets. So then I, I keep repeating that. I then re-pull the cells together, and then I reshuffle them into wells with a different barcode added, okay? So now all of the cells have the same barcode uh, after the first round, and then I re-pull them together, and then I split them back up, but now randomly into the same set of 100 wells, okay? So instead of having 10,000 wells, I only have 100 wells. Instead of having 10,000 droplets, I only have 100 buckets that I'm putting the cells into. Every cell does not get its own bucket ever. There's no point where one cell is alone in a bucket. Every single time I just partition my cells into you know, hundreds of cells at a time in each bucket. But I do this multiple times. So that basically means that after I've done this multiple times, every single cell has been labeled with a series of barcodes, first green, then red, then blue, then yellow. And that basically means that that one RNA molecule went through bucket number four, bucket number 17, bucket number 41, bucket number 27, okay? In order for two molecules to have gone through the same set of three different buckets, they must with some confidence that, de that depends on the number of rounds that I did this. The first round, I only have you know, if I only have, a, if I have a red barcode, I basically have one chance in a hundred of having the same barcode if I wasn't in the same cell. If in the second round I have a red and a blue barcode, I only have one chance in a hundred in having the same exact barcode if I'm not in the same cell. After the third round, I have only one chance in a million of basically having the same set of three barcodes even though I was in different cells. So basically, in the end, I'm basically confident that if I have the same set of three barcodes for that RNA molecule, it must have been labeled through first the red bucket, then the green bucket, then the blue bucket. Raise your hand if you're with me on this one. Yeah, awesome. Who thinks this is like awesomely cool? <laughs>
Yes? <laughs> cool. So, so basically, here we are with three different technologies. The Good question. Oh, sorry. There's, a, there's two questions. Yeah, hold on one second. Uh, is barcode addition sequential? Yes, absolutely. How can the barcode enter the cell and anneal to every mRNA? So that's where the funky chemistry happens. Basically, you're doing the, those reactions in a cell permeable fashion. So all of those barcodes basically permeate inside the cell using different technologies and then enter the, bar, enter the cell and label all of the mRNAs of that cell without ever breaking the cell open, okay? And then the first question, sorry, was, is barcode addition sequential? Yes, this picture is incorrect here, but this picture is correct here. So basically in my little strings, I'm basically adding the barcodes in a sequential fashion and therefore, red, blue, green is different from red, green, blue. Does that answer your questions, guys? Awesome. Any other questions? Perfect. Um, these, are, these are awesome questions, so keep them coming. These are really great. Okay, so, so this is a totally awesome technology. So basically, that means that all I need is 100 buckets. I don't need 10,000 buckets. I don't need a million buckets. And with 100 buckets reused over and over again, I can basically end up with one chance in 100 million or one chance in 10 billion and so on and so forth of being in the same well. So that basically means that I can carry out arbitrarily large, massive reactions and effectively, you know, figure out the cell of origin of each of those as long as I can go through this procedure of putting my uh, individual cells back into that bucket and back into that uh, picture and then redistributing them to my 100 buckets. Okay? So here are the three technologies, basically, that, that are sort of enabling us to do this in a massive, massive scale. The first and oldest and still much more expensive is, uh, you know, this, um, you know, uh, smart seek technology where you're basically putting individual cells into individual uh, uh, plate wells. The second technology is this uh, still the cheapest uh, and now extremely robust and extremely widely used um, uh, drop uh, seek uh, or in drop or um, very often referred to as 10x because this is the company that sells those kits uh, extremely widely and then the third technology which is still emerging and still has great great potential for uh, you know scaling up is um, you know uh, either uh, split seq or uh, psi RNA seq, SCI for combinatorial indexing. Okay? So split seq or psi RNA seq. And basically, for all of these approaches, you basically harvest your cells, then you do your single cell processing, and then you profile, you create your library, and then you sequence, and uh, you know, then you do analysis. Okay? So, the first is cells in wells, uh, traps and valves. The second one is droplets, where again, you have a well for every cell, and those wells are not microfluidic anymore. Now they're individual liquid droplets. So you have tens of thousands of reactions in, uh, in parallel. And then the last one is big, big buckets of reactions, many cells at a time, but the cells are being reshuffled combinatorially uh, enabling you to figure out from the first, second, third, and fourth barcode um, what is the unique identity and the common provenance of each of those uh, RNA molecules. Okay? Who feels that they've learned stuff so far? Yes? Awesome. Very cool. So now, let's talk about some of the downsides. How do we deal with noise? How do we deal with doublets? And how do we deal with other SCRNAC issues? And then we're going to switch to mass computational challenges associated with those. Is there a way to put UMI into the pool approach? Uh, yes. So in fact, the pool approach, uh, you can simply carry out an additional... Actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I think yes, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I, I, you know, I believe so, but I'm not sure. Okay. So, uh, how do we deal with noise with doublets and other issues? So, uh, first of all, uh, one challenge is our RNA contamination. So, basically, inside every one of your cells, translation needs to happen. And for every translation reaction, you need a different ribosome. 
And these ribosomes are basically primarily RNA with a bunch of auxiliary proteins. So that basically means that for every protein I make and for every RNA that I use to make that protein, I have another RNA which is currently translating that protein. So if you look at the relative abundance of RNA, I basically have, I don't know, 20 copies of my favorite gene and a million copies of the ribosome. So if I basically sequence, uh, you know, randomly, chances are that whatever RNA I pick up is going to be a ribosome uh, RNA. So there's many ways of trying to remove this huge amount of uh, RNA, uh, of ribosomal RNA, uh, which basically overwhelms mRNA by, you know, a factor of, uh, you know, 100 to 2. And poly A selection is one approach where you're basically capturing RNAs that have a polyadenylation signal, which is usually only found for long non-coding RNAs and for uh, which are at very low abundance and for uh, mRNAs, for messenger RNAs, which encode proteins. So that's sort of the first approach. The second approach is to actually uh, go in and chop up uh, ribosomal RNA. So basically, you can actually specifically ribodeplete uh, using that. The second uh, challenge is PCR has biases. So when I amplify a particular mRNA molecule, uh, the first mRNA molecule to be amplified might actually just win out in a rich get richer kind of approach where because it's the first one to be amplified, it now has many, many more templates, all of which will now be further amplified, causing an, a combinatorial sort of ex exponential explosion in the number of uh, molecules uh, and the number, sorry, in the number of sequencing reads from that one molecule. So to prevent that, one way to do that is to basically um, carry out this, um, uh, you know, particular template switching uh, oligos that basically allows you to sort of uh, limit the number of um, times that the same molecule is amplified. And you also add, as I mentioned earlier, these um, uh, unique molecular identifier or UMI that basically allows you to sort of recognize that this particular amplification is from um, the same exact molecule. You then have to deal with all kinds of quality control metrics. So basically, you want to ask, should I keep a particular cell? Was it a good quote unquote cell or was it a bad quote unquote cell? And the way to do that is all kinds of standard metrics that have been used before for RNA-seq as well. So basically, what fraction of my reads actually align to the genome? What fraction of my uh, transcripts have I successfully covered? Uh, is there a lot of ribosomal RNA contamination? Uh, do I have duplicates, uh, which we're going to talk about soon? What is the overall complexity of uh, the number of different genes that I have captured? And what is the probability of detecting any one transcript relative to overall uh, the overall abundance. So uh, template uh, switching, uh, I will not describe in detail, but the, basically what template switching allows you to do is somehow um, uh, limit that reaction and sort of introduce an extra step where you, um, you basically limit the number of non-template switching reactions that are allowed to happen, effectively reducing the initial step until you're able to actually uh, switch the templates. But I can provide more information uh, about that offline. Um, all right, so then let's talk about some of these uh, quality uh, control metrics. So basically, depending on how many cells you're looking at, your alignment rate uh, can differ uh, greatly, uh, depending on what technology you're using. Your rRNA contamination can differ greatly. So basically, you know, if you um, uh, sequence with different technologies, you basically end up with more RNA or less RNA. You can also ask where are the reads coming from? Uh, basically, are they coming from exonic regions? And again, that's what you would like to see, uh, or UTRs. Uh, and much more likely, or much less desirably, uh, you want to know that they're not coming from intronic or intergenic regions, which basically would suggest that somehow you're capturing either DNA or uh, pre-mRNA and so on and so forth. 
you can also ask how much of uh, my trend, how, how many of my transcripts am I covering, depending on how expressed they are. So the more expressed, the more likely you are to capture them. And the low expressed transcripts, you might not capture very much. And then depending on what technology you're using, you can capture more or less of those uh, rarer transcripts. And you can also ask where along the transcript are my reads happening? So basically between the five prime end and the three prime end, uh, you know, am I missing the information? And you can see here how the number of, uh, the amount of coverage gets uh, reduced as they go uh, further into that reverse uh, uh, transcription reaction. You can also ask what is the overall complexity of the number of genes that are detected, again, depending on the uh, overall expression. And this is sort of the template switching uh, that um, I mentioned earlier, where you're basically you know, switching from one template back to the other template in order to sort of um, increase your, uh, your capture. So the first round of full density DNA means that the PCR duplicates uh, can unfortunately not be identified unless you add this uh, UMI. And then of course, the noise actually depends on the expression, namely, if you look at a random deviation from the actual number of molecules, up here, that random deviation will not have too much of an effect because these genes are highly expressed. But down here, the random deviation will have a dramatic effect. Uh, so, you know, over here for housekeeping genes, you can actually detect them quite reliably, but unfortunately, they're the ones that I care the least about. And then for linked RNAs, uh, you know, I can detect them uh, very poorly, and I'm quite unsure of their true expression level because of their low abundance. And then of course, this depends on uh, different cell types and different cells. So you might actually have uh, you know, different curves of this overall detectability for different cells, depending on the overall quality of the cell, for example. So again, some cells you will capture much better than other cells. Uh, yeah, it's also important, as I mentioned earlier, to distinguish the two, two different types of noise. One is noise that is technical, and uh, it's actually coming from sampling or from PCR biases. And then the other noise is actually biological, which is simply that, you know, at any one point, any one cell might or might not be expressing a particular transcript. And you can distinguish these, um, um, you know, in different ways. Another major uh, challenge of uh, single cell RNA sequencing is doublets, namely, these are cells that are um, captured in the same droplet. So remember uh, before how we're basically flowing in individual cells into individual droplets and then capturing them. So one droplet might actually encapsulate two different cells. So that basically means that they will get the exact same barcodes for all their RNA molecules. And the number of droplets increases with the number of single cells that I'm recovering. Basically, uh, there's a limitation to the overall number of cells that can be captured because as I capture more and more cells, I capture more droplets. So basically, very often, the reason why we stop at 5,000 cells is that the you know, uh, droplet percentage increases dramatically after that. And it's very difficult to recognize if, to, if a particular quote unquote cell, i.e. a particular barcode, came from a single cell or from two cells. Basically, the only way to recognize that is if you have, uh, you know, if you're able to computationally deconvolve the two expression signatures, which now correspond to the mixture of, say, an oligodendrocyte cell and a microglial cell. So basically, if that droplet captured both cells together, you're going to get a mixed up signature, and it's going to be very difficult uh, to distinguish which was which. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one, on the droplet, on the, on the perfect, so on the doublet uh, challenge. So one way to do that is to actually, uh, prior to my reactions, actually create cellular barcodes so that the cells themselves, uh, as they're coming in, are barcoded. So you can basically uh, label your cDNA by having um, a lipid tag index, index that sort of goes in and deposits within, your, within each, each one of your cells 
uh, a DNA barcode of some length. So that basically means that I can pre-label my cells prior to this and effectively take a large number of cells and then use, you know, maybe split them, I don't know, 20 fold or something, and then use a different barcode label for each one of the 20 different wells that I've now split my cells into. That allows me to now detect if I have a combination of barcodes in my different uh, individual uh, droplets, which basically suggests that these two uh, cells in the same droplet were in fact individually labeled in those uh, 20 pools. Which technology was your question referencing? How does the template switch? Oh, okay. Um, all right. So that basically means that um, you know I could basically label the um, you know these these uh, individual cells into sort of ten different colors, so that after the fact I can actually remove the uh, doublets this way. Another way to do that is to actually combine, and it sounds a little crazy, but combine two different samples or multiple different samples in a multiplexing kind of way where I've now got both different properties of the samples and different barcodes associated with the samples, but also genetic variants associated with the different samples. So, if you basically look at these individual uh, DNA variants associated with, say, profiling 20 different individuals, then you can use genetic variants associated with these individuals to, after the fact, basically say, across my 10,000 genes that I'm detecting, in the three prime regions of those genes, I can basically detect individual RNA differences at the genetic level and effectively use that to distinguish between cells that are coming from only one individual and cells that are coming from a pair of individuals. Is everybody with me on this one? So basically, uh, and then what's really cool about this uh, multi-seq approach, this multiplex, uh, multiplexing using lipid tag indices approach, is that I can actually use it to carry out um, multiplexing. So instead of profiling only one sample for each 10x reaction, I can basically profile nine samples. So I can take, I don't know, three schizophrenia brains, three control brains, and three bipolar brains, and then label them individually using these oligo hashtags, and then pull all of the material into a single nuclear suspension, and then carry out this uh, 10x sequencing from the pooled material, enabling me to recognize when doublets happen because they will actually be combinations of barcodes, and therefore, the undetected um, doublets will only be, you know, uh, much more rare because there will be only one, one out of nine doublets basically will be undetectable because it will happen to capture exactly the same uh, well that I'm multiplexing if I do a nine-fold multiplexing. If I do 20-fold multiplexing, then I have one chance out of 20 of being an undetected doublet. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Yeah, awesome, good. So uh, using this approach, Brother Zika basically profiled exactly what I showed you. And here you can see that, you know, if you look at the by subject or by 10x library or by diagnosis, uh, uh, TSNE pods, you basically see that there's, um, you know, a very good mixing uh, that happens, you know, in most places, which indicates that, you know, you can, you can also uh, do batch correction using this. So the advantage of that is that instead of having to do a separate batch correction for each individual, and therefore you wouldn't know if perhaps a bipolar signature was corrected away from a schizophrenia signature, from a control signature, because of the sample-specific batch correction, you can now do batch correction across samples from different phenotypes and therefore not overcorrect for the phenotypic contribution, which you can see here. Okay, so uh, who's with me so far? Yes, good. Any questions? Oh, I see a question coming up. Is multiplexing the same as sequencing different samples individually? 
Um, no, multiplexing is basically sequencing different samples together. So after I've done this multiplexing, I now have these cells that are individually barcoded with different colors. I mix all of these cells together into each uh, sequencing reaction. Does that answer your question? Is it cheaper? Yes, it's also cheaper. Basically, the cost uh, of this, uh, if you multiplex about 20-fold, uh, drops from, you know, by a factor of two. And then the idea is that you can't drop the sequencing costs because I, you still need to sequence the same amount. You need to sequence, you know, as deep as you need. Uh, but you're dropping the cost on the 10x uh, kits, which uh, is about half the cost. So basically, on half the cost, which is the sequencing, you can't drop. But on the other half of the cost, which is the 10x kits, you're basically uh, dropping by, I don't know, a factor of 20 if you do 20-fold multiplexing or a factor of nine if you do nine-fold multiplexing. So in the end, it sort of averages to about, you know, you know, 45% of the cost if you multiplex about, I think, nine-fold. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Um, all right. So we've talked a lot about the technology. Let's now switch to what are some of the computational challenges in single cell learning seq uh, data analysis. So here we are, we basically processed our data. We've created our counts of genes per cell. So basically for every one of many, many cells, I have the expression of many, many genes. And I have many of those count matrices. The next questions are, great, where do I go from here? So first of all, we talked a little bit about quality control. So basically, what is the overall sequencing depth? What is the, um, you know, how's that um, related to particular size factors? And then uh, how can I do batch correction? So basically, that's a major computational challenge with a lot of effort uh, in being able to sort of take um, samples that have a lot of sort of, uh, for example, all of the green cells came from the same person. All of the purple cells came from the same person. All of the red cells came from the same person. And you see very little mixing. That basically means that every person and every batch is contributing its own subsets of cells. So it's very difficult to know what's Alzheimer's and what's non-Alzheimer's. If one Alzheimer's individual is green and another Alzheimer's individual is purple and a non-Alzheimer's individual is red, that basically tells us that you know, there's uh, something is being driven by a uh, batch rather than true biology. Is everybody with me on this one? Yeah. Uh, and then the goal of batch correction is to basically make sure that these cells are overlapping nicely across the different clusters. The second challenge, of course, normalization, basically being able to sort of uh, infer how deeply did I sequence each of the cells, each of the samples, how do I normalize across different experiments, and then selecting features. What are the genes that are the most variable in my experiment? What are the you know, other genes that are the least variable? For example, uh, housekeeping genes. And uh, the, the next one is visualization. We talked uh, a little bit about that when in the um, uh, TISNI uh, lecture. Basically, we saw how we can actually visualize the layout of individual cells by um, embedding them into a two-dimensional space that tries to capture the same distance properties between pairs of cells, and which then allows me to label all kinds of additional information in these plots. For example, I could color the cell type that I'm inferring. Uh, I could color the um, expression of a particular gene to know which of these cells express that particular gene. And for example, if that gene is a marker of enterocytes, and that gene lights up here, then I might be able to say, aha, these particular subset of cells are likely to be enterocytes, and so on and so forth. So basically the first challenge is, uh, you know, after we've done all that, to then cluster the cells to, in, to, to reveal groups of cells that are behaving in similar ways. So if there's this continuum that I end up with, and I want to be able to define clusters that somehow break up this continuum into discrete blocks. And maybe within these blocks, I might have you know, different cell types. Is everybody with me on this one? Yeah, awesome. And that's a cell level analysis. Basically, how do I first cluster my cells? 
so that I can break up the continuum into different colors. How do I then annotate these different clusters based on um, which uh, you know, markers are associated with each of those? So for example, uh, I might be able to define, to use a previously defined set of markers that basically tell me what is the identity of each of those cell types, or I might uh, use um, uh, you know, the novel marker, mar marker identification to sort of infer which are the cells corresponding to each of those clusters. Once I have identified my uh, clusters and I've annotated them, then I can do all kinds of cool things. I can basically ask how are individual cells traveling through these trajectory, uh, through these different cell states and through these different cell types. For example, progenitor cells might be here and they might be differentiated down into those different cell types and still maintain distinct cellular states uh, across them. Do we have a question? No, we have uh, responses. Um, so, and then after that, I might be interested in the gene level dynamics of how is a particular gene expressed as I go down this continuum. So basically if I go from, uh, you know, the progenitor cell into a stem cell, this is effectively like looking at differentiation time, but it's not exactly differentiation time because these uh, genes are profiled in different cells each time. Once I profile the cell, I've killed that cell. So I, I can't see the actual temporal course of a single cell going through time, but I can kind of order the cells as if they were the same cell at different stages and effectively create a pseudo time between them. Is everybody with me on the concept of pseudo time here? Perfect. Um, and then, of course, I could also ask, are there some metastable states? For example, states that are in between these attractors where that cell, or there's, you know, there's very few cells sitting here, even though they're transitioning through here. If a cell is here, it's very likely to sort of become a tough cell. But if it stays here, it's very likely to sort of stay a progenitor cell. And this is basically at the cellular level highlighted in red, I, and I can also ask what is my uh, change in cell type composition between one condition and another condition. If I look at Alzheimer's disease, for example, maybe I'll have more cells coming from the middle, but if I look at, uh, you know, control individuals, I might have more cells coming from the periphery. So that can allow us to ask how is a particular variable at the cell level uh, affecting the presence of that group of cells across this uh, visualization uh, plot. And I can also carry out a series of gene level analysis that basically allow me to ask what is the differential expression between two different conditions. So for example, between Alzheimer's and non-Alzheimer's, I might find that these genes are highly expressed and highly significant. And this is typically shown in these volcano plots that basically look at the fold change in the x-axis and then the FTR or the significance or the p-value on the y-axis or the negative log 10 p-value. That basically allow me to say that, yes, these genes show a high fold change and a high significance and so on and so forth. I could also carry out this analysis at the level of gene sets to basically ask what are the gene sets that are differentially active between these different conditions. And I could also infer gene regulatory networks based on the relationships of those genes to each other as I look across my uh, count matrix. So basically I could ask how correlated is the expression pattern of that gene across cells to the next gene across cells and then cluster those together to basically infer networks of gene-gene relationships. Or is a transcriptional factor expression in pseudotime preceding the expression of its downstream genes again also in pseudotime. You can basically see that the transcriptional factor goes on here and then the downstream target genes sort of get expressed down there, okay? There's additional uh, gene level analysis, such as uh, clustering of similar genes or reduction of the dimensionality or imputation of missing data or deconvolution of false paramnesic data, which uh, again are, are major, major challenges. And then another sort of cell level analysis is combining these paramnesic data with um, uh, multi-omics with other kinds of uh, data sets and data types, and also being able to study all these processes 
across uh, multiple resolutions. So let's now walk through some of the computational methods that are uh, widely used for addressing these uh, challenges. What percent of RNA is actually captured in individual beads that go to be amplified and sequenced? Well, it depends how far you push your sequencing reaction. Uh, it's, you know, if you push that too high, you're going to end up with uh, a lot of wasted sequencing. Uh, but if you push that too low, you're, you know, wasting a big chunk of your RNA sample. In practice, it's only a small percentage of the RNA that you're actually profiling because of uh, not pushing this uh, too far because of uh, doublets uh, in, in terms of the numbers of cells, not pushing the RNA sequencing too far so that you don't end up sequencing the same uh, barcodes, uh, the same RNA molecules over and over again through uh, these PCR amplification artifacts. Um, and also in terms of bank for buck, you might be better off sequencing uh, RNA from many samples uh, in different experiments rather than the same sample much more deeply. So if I'm a computational biologist, I'd rather have, uh, you know, fairly deep profiling of many, many cells or of many, many conditions rather than a super, super deep profiling of only one condition because the amount of experimental noise cannot be controlled. And sort of if I put a lot of eggs in the same basket, I might end up, you know, not getting as, as rich uh, information out. Does that answer your questions? Um, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, how do we extract biological insights from single cell RNA seq data? First of all, first of all, how do we ca ca calculate cell to cell correlation, gene to gene correlation, imputation of missing values, cellular trajectories, and differentiation, and so on and so forth. So for clustering similar cells, there's many different approaches that have been developed, looking at uh, environmental stimuli, cell development, cell cycles, spatial context, in order to be able to sort of capture uh, all of this information and in order, order to be able to go from complex tissues to individual cells. So there's been many examples where you can actually go into specific cases and recognize individual cell types. Um, and these have been used, for example, in the retina to uh, recognize cell types that were previously not known. So basically, in the retina alone, you have 39 different cell types that are identified from clustering of the single cell RNA seq data. And this has basically recapitulated decades of um, minute analysis and also captured additional cell types that were previously not known, revealing markers for those cell types that have now been validated. You could also cluster similar genes by basically uh, recognizing what are the most variable genes versus what are the housekeeping genes, and then um, being able to uh, uh, ask about sort of relationships between genes across those uh, different cells. I'm going through this a little more quickly to have more time to talk about some of the deep learning uh, methodologies. There's been a lot of uh, challenge with the zeros. Basically, if you look at 10,000 cells versus 10,000 cells, you basically get very good correlation. But if you look at two individual cells, you get many, many zeros in one cell or the other cell. Uh, and many of these are actually just simply biological. You know, these cells are just simply not expressing uh, those genes. So yes, uh, and, and, but also some other zeros are due to undersampling. For example, if you look at you know, millions of reads versus only thousands of reads, you basically see that indeed many of the zeros go away when you do that. There's been a lot of work on dimensionality reduction, basically being able to sort of project the data into lower dimensional representations. So if you look at PCA, for example, with the 300 de cell data set, you can see here the three different components, and you can uh, recognize that these cells are in fact behaving differently based on which part of the PCA space uh, do they fall in. Uh, you can also interpret that dimensionality reduction by basically looking at how cells are moving along these two principal components, uh, you know, between the beginning of the pseudotime to the end of the pseudotime and sort of building these uh, trajectories. There's been a lot of work on sort of zero inflated negative binomial models uh, to basically generalize linear factor analysis and effectively being able to uh, uh, recognize what are the sample level covariates, what are the gene level covariates, 
and what are unknown covariates that might be driving the signal by effectively factorizing the gene expression matrix along these different dimensions, both capturing you know, known parameters and unknown parameters of uh, variation. We talked about PSNE uh, last time, so I'm not going too much into this. Um, and then also distinguishing the different uh, cell types. There's a lot of work in uh, being able to first cluster and then annotate effectively not individual cells, but individual clusters based on the expression of marker genes within those clusters. Uh, for example, there's single cell consensus uh, clustering, which basically looks at, uh, you know, uh, your input filtering uh, different genes and then uh, calculating different distances between those uh, individual uh, cells and then transforming along uh, different dimensions and ultimately building your consensus for, uh, you know, each of those cells. There's been a lot of work going beyond clusters that try to sort of break up the cell space into discrete chunks and actually just building diffusion maps that instead look at differentiation along these trajectories to both recognize what is the traditional means of differentiation, for example, from stem cells into different lineages and then down this way. And also are there trans differentiation pathways that basically take you from one state to another state without first going to de-differentiation then re-differentiation. Uh, a lot of work on archetype analysis, basically being able to capture what are the principal archetypes of, uh, you know, the, the, the principal exemplars, if you wish, of uh, those cells and then using those to effectively define uh, the dimensions of your space and then using those dimensions to capture uh, the variability of your cells and your samples. And that allows you to basically combine both discrete and continuous uh, measures of uh, distance. And then uh, there's a lot of work in trying to match cell types across data sets. So instead of reclustering and re-annotating every single one of these um, uh, new experiments individually, can we instead build a set of known markers and known signatures that we can then apply at the cell level for any one new data set? Uh, there's a lot of work in uh, trying to carry out multi-resolution analysis to basically recognize at uh, both super high resolution and sort of low resolution what is effectively the, the topography of cell space and what are the relationships of fine grain relationships and sort of large uh, grain relationships uh, between them. And ultimately building a network that tells you how are each of the cells related to each other and how are each cell state within those related to each other and how are substates related to each other and how are individual cells related to each other within uh, this uh, network. And this is achieved through an adaptive nearest neighbor uh, graph that allows you to do that. Um, and you can also interpret this variability across different uh, signatures and build trajectories through cell space, as we talked about, using this pseudo time to predict either differentiation or uh, cell cycle and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of methods that have been built for uh, being able to carry out these analyses. So I encourage you to spend time looking at this um, slide and, uh, you know, evaluating the different methods in terms of the type of structure that is built on the network, the robustness strategy, if there's any additional input requirements, and whether the message is biased, scalable with respect to cells, scalable with respect to genes, whether the code and documentation is available, and how easy it is to use. And you can basically think of this as um, sort of for every one of those single cell expression analysis data sets, you basically have a plan that uh, measures similarity in different ways or how to project into the manifold in different ways, how to then cluster within that manifold, uh, whether you're building a graph or not, how you're actually finding paths through trajectories and how you're actually ordering the cells along these paths. And then depending on that, you can basically uh, group the different methods of single cell uh, trajectory and pseudo time identification. There's been a lot of work also on imputation of missing data, uh, both for spatial uh, transcriptomics and for um, 
you know, just non-spatial transcriptomics. So, for example, there's this uh, very popular method for Markov affinity-based graph imputation of cells, or MAGIC, that basically builds a graph of the cells with respect to each other, and then uh, walks along the cell-cell similarity graph using a neighborhood-based Markov affinity matrix, and sharing information across cells to effectively generate an imputed count matrix that tries to eliminate as many zeros as possible. So you end up with the relationship between two different variables, for example, these two different genes, being much more meaningful after you carry out this imputation than before. And the reason is that you don't have as many zeros uh, to worry about. And that imputation can also take a matrix of cell counts, uh, of gene counts per cell, and complete it effectively with uh, missing data that allows you to now find much more uh, rich interaction patterns between them. So before uh, this imputation, you basically have many, many zeros and very little correlation. But then after this iterative refinement, you end up with much more interesting relationships between uh, pairs of cells. And there's a lot of methods out there for uh, carrying this out. Basically, you can do uh, model-based imputation, uh, data smoothing, data reconstruction, uh, using machine learning approaches, and uh, using external uh, information. And some of the methods that we're highlighting today are uh, highlighted here. And there's also work in integrating multiple uh, data sets. So basically, um, you know, across, uh, you know, different, ways of finding matching cells across different data types. So there's basically just to summarize a lot of normalization, imputation, clustering, trajectory, data integration, and evaluation methodologies. And I encourage you to, again, uh, spend time to, to read through those. So um, <laughs> this is the huge, huge number of um, sort of computational methods that have been developed for single cell RNA-seq. I wanted to focus in particular on a subset of those uh, for uh, deep learning in particular. So one approach that I think you guys will find very appealing is that if you're trying to do batch correction, you can effectively use an autoencoder to do that. So MMD ResNet effectively built this maximum mean discrepancy loss function and then trained a ResNet, or a residual network that you heard about uh, in lecture, uh, with this particular MMD-based score function to learn a set of weights that match distributions across the different batches. And what you can see here is that before correction, the cells from different batches are very, very separate, but after correction, they overlap greatly. And then uh, if you compare this with uh, combat, for example, another approach for batch correction, you can see that there's a lot of batches that remain, batch effects that remain, whereas here they're actually you know, corrected away. And you can see here that it outperforms uh, many methods for doing this. And then the whole concept is that the autoencoder is able to capture a lower dimensional representation of your data and then reproject it back up to a higher dimensional representation that effectively eliminates these batch effects by training the representation to match the distributions across your different batches. DESC or deep embedding for single cell clustering desk is a, a way of carrying out batch correction in a cell type specific way. So the idea here is very similar. We're going to build an autoencoder again, but in this particular case, there's a hierarchical, there's a nested approach that allows you to initialize a clustering obtained from the autoencoder and then iteratively optimize this clustering objective function for each of the clusters. And you can see here, for example, that this approach effectively captures uh, overlapping distributions for each of the clusters, whereas other approaches are effectively not uh, creating these overlapping uh, profiles. And you can see here how this iterative approach works over time, whereas you know, at the initialization, they're quite separate. As you start moving to more and more epochs of training, you end up with very highly overlapping distributions. And this uh, outperforms a lot of sort of the non-deep uh, learning approaches. So again, the whole uh, concept of learning a lower dimensional representation and projecting it back out in a cell type specific way in this particular case. Uh, 
autoimpute is another autoencoder which is now used for filling in zeros and then the idea here is that uh, you can filter the raw gene expression data you can feed that process matrix to the autoimpute model and you can learn an expression data representation that then allows you to reconstruct the full matrix from that lower dimensional space so you're feeding it the sparse gene representation you're training it to learn both the encoder and the decoder functions that best regenerate imputed expression with no dropouts. And you can see here without imputation, the data is very lumped together. But after imputation, you basically have this very nice separation across the different PCs. And even magic that we saw earlier is lumping together all of these different cell types, whereas this auto impute, this auto encoder based imputation method is actually separating them very nicely. And you can see here that as you go to more and more highly expressed genes, magic still has many zeros, whereas uh, this imputation approach uh, has fewer and fewer uh, zeros. And then NCVI is one of the most interesting uh, approaches that effectively uses a neural network to estimate your parameters in a variational inference network. So the idea is that you're learning a nonlinear embedding of the cells for any kind of analysis task. You basically have uh, different neural networks that are used to compute the embeddings and the expression distribution. And you even have neural networks that basically calculate the parameters of the Gaussians that you use for these embeddings. So you basically uh, model your observed data as a sample, which is drawn from a zero inflated negative binomial or a ZIN distribution as we talked about earlier. And this is conditioned on the batch annotations of each cell, if the batch uh, labels are available, and on two additional unobserved random variables, basically the nuisance variation, which is a 1D Gaussian, which models the differences in capture efficiency and sequencing depth and cell-specific scaling factors for each experiment. And then the remaining unknown variation, which is another 10-dimensional Gaussian, which basically captures biological differences between cells. And that basically represents every cell as a point in a lower dimensional latent space that then maps the latent variables of this distribution through these additional neural networks. So this basically does a batch correction and normalized estimate of the percentage of transcripts in each cell and then uses these estimates for differential analysis. And you can see here this SAVI approach retains the biological signal in these diverse data sets. It's able to sort of, you know, correct for these batches very, very nicely. And it is also able to carry out differential expression analysis uh, very, very nicely. So going beyond RNA, there's been a lot of methods for uh, observing histone modifications uh, at the single cell level, chromatin accessibility at the single cell level, genome sequencing at the single cell level, DNA methylation, uh, protein, uh, intracellular proteins or cell surface proteins, or spatial positioning or the trajectories of these cells through pseudo time and the differential lineages of these. Uh, and then I include here uh, again on the slides that you can uh, produce uh, different ways of capturing both unimodal data. So mRNA uh, that I mentioned earlier. So we talked about split-seq and sirna-seq and cell-seq and smart-seq and 10x and drop-seq, uh, et cetera. But there's a huge number of other approaches for genome sequence, for chromatin accessibility, DNA methylation, histone modifications or chromatin conformation, as well as multimodal approaches that allow you to simultaneously capture histone modifications in spatial, mRNA and lineage, lineage and spatial, mRNA and spatial, mRNA and cell surface, and so, so forth. So this is uh, an incredible field. It's moving very, very rapidly. And I just want to uh, point out one example of single cell ataxy that's basically looking at individual DNA accessibility information from individual cells. And you can do all kinds of really cool analysis with that by basically asking across the thousands of loci that have matches to my particular transcription factor, can I use those to infer the activity of that transcription factor? And then to learn about the correlation patterns between each transcription factor and each other transcription factor at the level of individual cells through all of the targets of those transcription factors. And you can integrate single cell attack and single cell RNA-seq using ChromeVar, and uh, that basically allows you to infer both the matching of the cells to each other based on the expression and DNA accessibility relationships. 
and you can do that uh, systematically across many different cells. So there's a lot of single cell multiomics approaches out there. There's many different approaches for achieving single cell multiomics by either capturing individual cells in wells and then carrying out those there, or by partitioning your cell into cytosol and nucleus and profiling them separately, or by tagging with epitopes your individual cells and then carrying out uh, perturbations in each of those, or by inferring from the DNA sequence variation the relationships between them by introducing these uh, variants. So what we talked about today was a lot of technological background on single cell RNA-seq, single cell tag-seq, and single cell multiomics, how these technologies were scaled up to be able to carry out profiling of tens of thousands of cells and tens of thousands of genes simultaneously, challenges of dealing with noise, with doublets, and other single cell RNA-seq issues, uh, such as the large number of zeros, computational challenges in single cell RNA-seq data analysis. Again, a very rich set of slides that allow you to uh, explore these different methods in more detail. And a small number of examples uh, of deep learning methods for single cell RNA-seq data analysis, which is uh, growing very rapidly. And then how to go beyond single cell RNA-seq with single cell taxi and multi-omics. Sorry for running a little over. Um, who's been so far? Yes? Feeling like you've learned stuff? Good. Any other remaining questions on the whole uh, lecture? Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Sorry for running a little over, but um, this is a very, very rapidly moving field. We're gonna talk about single cell very briefly again next Thursday in the context of disease. So next week we're starting the variation module. So we're gonna be looking at deep learning approaches for both uh, variation uh, and disease studies. So stay tuned and see you again next Tuesday. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.